Very good. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. Welcome to the core devs meeting number six. Today, we have an exciting agenda with a lot of interesting subjects. And we will be starting out today by sharing with you the latest announcement on the grant with Figment, who joined us as our third core devs team and at the graph. Then we're going to be talking about GIP and governance updates, which will be heavily focused on curation. We have a few discussions there waiting for us. Streaming Fast will give us an update on where they are in the integration and also uh, have a discussion about something that they've posted last week, in, which is called the fire hose. And Semiotic has shared with us some thoughts last month during the core devs meeting as well. And it's going to be a progression of the discussion here where we're going to hear about automated pro-social negotiations in the graph protocol. So that should be very interesting. And we're going to have some time at the end for Q&A as well. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Eva for the Figment announcement. Awesome, thank you so much, Oliver. So I just wanted to take a few minutes to you know, discuss with the community how excited we are about decentralizing our core developers and our ecosystem. Uh, you know, we launched the graph, you know, with the initial edge and node team, uh, streaming fast, you know, now welcomed in and now Figment. And I couldn't be more excited just to see the diverse caliber, you know, that each of these teams bring. I think it's very easy to think, you know, we're all competing or, you know, we're all self-interested, but there is a reality where you can align multiple teams around one mission on a protocol. And, you know, what the edge and node streaming fast and Figment and, you know, semiotic, sommelier, all these teams bring is very unique. And I think it's really going to set uh, the graph forward in the future for long term. Uh, so with that, we'll hand it back to Oliver. Yeah, I would like to give Joseph an opportunity to just say a few words um, from the Figment side. Hello, everyone. I'm Joseph, and I am uh, the core dev uh, PM uh, on Figment. And uh, as Eva said, we are super excited and happy to be joining forces with the graph. Uh, for the last couple of months, I've been working alongside some community members and that showed me how the community is special and uh, we are so lucky to have it. So as you know, our decision about our uh, uh, 5 million grant was the easiest decision that we made and one of our proudest. We are really happy to be joining forces here. And just to give you a bit of color on what we're gonna be bringing to the graph ecosystem. So for the last couple of years, we've been indexing uh, multiple blockchains. And as you know, the graph is indexing, uh, as of today, indexing Ethereum. So we're gonna be taking this precious and lovely <laughs> technology that everyone loves, and we're gonna be bringing it into other blockchains to enable more applications being built in the Web3. So we really look forward uh, into doing this. And for everyone that is interested to know more and have a deeper dive on our work, we invite you to join the indexer office hours, which is gonna be happening in two hours. And uh, our lead engineer there is going to give you a deep dive, and you can see the amazing work that we're going to be bringing. Exciting times. Thank you. Awesome. Well, welcome. And uh, for those of you who don't know about the Indexer uh, office hours, they happen in Discord. Uh, there's a dedicated channel there. Jim Cousins hosts those, and it should be a very exciting session today. It's going to be an, an hour dedicated you know, to, this, to this announcement. So tune in on that. Highly recommend joining. Okay, let's move on to GIP and, and governance updates. You do see on the screen uh, everything that is currently sort of in the pipeline. What is mostly um, actively discussed in the community uh, is around curation. Uh, no surprise, we've just launched curation last month. And there's a number of things that are at different stages of, of the discussion. And I'd like to start with the batch GNS transactions, which is, in other words, the deploy and signal proposal, which has also been reviewed by the council last week. And you can see that in the forum notes. And um, it is fairly far along. So we've got broad positive feedback there. And I'd like to hand it over to Ariel to give us an update on, on where we are with that, as well as the subgraph change of ownership. Yeah. Uh, hello, and thank you for being here for another uh, quarter of call. Um, as Oliver said, uh, one of the feedback we received from, from curation and, and now many people creating subgraphs and, and curating on subgraphs is um, that many times owners 
of a subgraph that is published in a new subgraph wants to mint an initial signal on that subgraph. And that's not currently possible because you need to patch those two things into a single transaction. So um, today it's open to the possibility of creating a subgraph and then someone else signaling before the, the app developer. So the, there's a PR that is open now in the, in the repo and anyone can take a look at that. Uh, that is batching um, different GNS uh, transactions by using a multi-call. That means that you can batch an arbitrary number of, of different transactions. You can signal multiple different subgraphs, but at the same time enables by, uh, deploying and signaling. So I think it's um, a pretty good um, addition to the, to the GNS, but I invite uh, everyone to take a look at the implementation and, and send any feedback in the PR. Uh, the other one is something that is being um, also raised in, the, in, the, in some of the feedback in the community that is um, changing the ownership of a subgraph. Uh, it, it happens with some of the teams that uh, they use a different address and they wanted to move a subgraph to a multi-sig or, or some other place, or even people created a subgraph and, uh, and they wanted to transfer it to the, to the official team. Uh, but it's not easily, uh, it can be done easily now. So uh, there's um, uh, this uh, investigation, we are, we are looking into an implementation of an ownership for subgraphs. So uh, whenever you create one, you can easily transfer to, to someone else. Um, so th these, these two are the, the main things um, that uh, are, one, one is already implemented, the other one is under um, uh, a candidate implementation, looking into the best way to implement it. Uh, about curation. And then we have this stable uh, delegation uh, yield. That is something that we talked in the previous um, call dev talk. It's under review by, uh, by indexers and, uh, and delegators. And it's already audited. Uh, and it's also in, a, in the PR um, uh, in the repo. Okay. Um, now I think I, uh, Brandon is going to talk about the curation tax, uh, right, Oliver? Yes, that is correct. So today, this proposal is is new. So this has uh, Brandon has posted this in the forum over the last uh, month. So Brandon, why don't you quickly introduce what this proposal is is about? Sure. Um, yeah. So this proposal, uh, funnily enough, is to lower the curation tax, which I'm sure most of you are aware is a tax that's paid on deposit to the bonding curves for a subgraph. Um, the impetus for writing this was based on feedback that had come to me from a number of places that uh, the costs, the total costs to a subgraph developer were a bit onerous, especially with respect to upgrades and changing versions. The idea being that every time you upgrade a subgraph, because you're exiting one bonding curve and entering a new one, you have to pay this curation tax again. Um, so what's interesting about this proposal is that it also the GIP for it, which you can find in the forums, also outlines a previously undisclosed um, economic attack that we call the subgraph withholding attack. And the curation tax, one of the primary functions of the curation tax was making this attack unprofitable. And the base, basically the way that this attack goes is that um, an attacker signals on a brand new subgraph, um, then they are the first and only indexer to that subgraph because they do not uh, actually release the subgraph manifest for that subgraph to the network. So no other indexer can come and index it. Um, they monopolize indexing rewards on that subgraph. Basically, you know, as long as the attack, um, uh, you know, goes on and other indexers are unable to come in and dilute the, the profits, you know, if you will, from that attack. Um, the mitigation for this attack that we've already had in the protocol basically from day one is a combination of the curation tax and the subgraph oracle. So the subgraph oracle, its responsibility is to basically monitor the network and disable indexing rewards on subgraphs whose manifests are not available to the network because that basically uh, impedes competition and impedes the ability of other honest indexers to come in and index the subgraph. Um, and then the curation tax also mitigates this attack by making it um, essentially penalize someone for trying that attack because they're paying the only cost of trying this attack, you know, in addition to the gas costs is the, uh, is the curation tax. And right now uh, we've, you know, monitored the, the subgraph Oracle that's running on the live network. It catches most uh, attacks within about eight to nine minutes, which is quite good. Um, that's, we have 
quite a bit of margin of error in our analyses. Um, and so that, you know, with respect to that attack specifically, we could lower, lower the curation tax um, from where it is today in the network. Um, I think Josh from, um, uh, I believe from Streaming Fast pointed out that that doesn't necessarily prove that we should lower the curation tax, right? And there might be other reasons to, um, to think that this could have um, knock-on effects. You know, one knock-on effect, for example, would be that in, if indexers uh, in equilibrium had like a baseline level of curation tax that they wanted subgraph developers to pay, it could just be that the amount signaled per subgraph increases in response. And in absolute terms, the, cur the amount that's paid as curation tax doesn't end up um, changing much. Um, I suspect that wouldn't be the dynamic, but that's um, there are counter arguments to be made here if you want to play devil's advocate. I think this is definitely one that needs a lot more input in the forums, and we'll probably end up doing a snapshot vote. I'd especially like to see input from uh, curators and um, subgraph developers you know, and how you feel about this change, given that there could be dynamics that might increase the equilibrium um, signaling amount, which you know decreases the curation tax, relatively speaking, but it could increase like cost of capital and opportunity cost. Um, so yeah, we'll, we can follow that up in the forums and feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, you're muted, Oliver. Yeah, thank you for that. So great, great segue into the next um, topic, which is dynamic curation tax. Um, let, let me just set that up. Um, we have probably one topic right now in, in the curator community that seems to be the most burning one, which presents itself as, as an issue where we have, you know, bought front running the bonding curve. So the incentive seems um, just too high right now to just instantly signal without doing a curator's job, which is to validate the quality and uh, economic values of a subgraph. And there have been a number of discussions around how can we solve for that. We had initially talked about the showroom, and we then later on discovered some slim chance discovered that uh, an attack, you know, is also doable in a showroom environment. It just, you know comes at a different point in time, but a similar dynamic is possible to do. Um, so then Slim Chance presented the idea of what is called the dynamic curation tax. And I'm gonna hand it over to you, Slim Chance, where you can maybe introduce that idea to the community and where we are in the discussions of that. Yeah, first of all, I want to say that uh, I really appreciate so many curators actively participating in the protocol discussions and on the forums and in Discord. And the challenges that you are facing are seen and heard and uh, closely monitored. So, um, uh, yeah, as I see it, there are three challenges that the uh, curation community is facing. One is the front running parts. And uh, also the the as Oliver Oliver says it's um, being first on the bonding curve has the highest amount of potential reward while also carrying the least amount of risk. So it encourages a, a behavior where curators are only trying to be the first on the bonding curve without doing their job and assessing the subgraph. And then the second uh, challenge is the high volatility around launch, and then. Uh, people are like losing interest and and it is uh, and less in engaging because there's this this high volatility around launch where people get burned and people some people earn a lot of money uh, bots earn a lot of money or a lot of, lot of GRT and the third one is that the the protocol is open to bait and switch attacks from from uh, developers where they can deploy a subgraph and then they can just move to another um, another subgraph uh, without any on-chain repercussions. So the dynamic curation tax um, seeks to address all three of these challenges. And right now it is being um, refined and heavily scrutinized to see if that is something that uh, is interesting to, to, to present in a more um 
more refined form to the community. And she, so that's, that's where it is right now. Very good. And, and, and to those who haven't read the proposal, um, Brendan just talked about the curation tax and to lower that from two and a half to 1%. Let's call that the steady state curation tax. <clears throat> and what Slim Chance is proposing is at the time a subgraph is newly deployed, we start out with a curation tax that is not 1%, for the new proposal right now, 2.5%. But we start out with a value that is much higher, call it something like 50%. And what it should be doing is to deter, you know, wins to be gained from very quickly, you know, curating and signaling on the bonding curve. And then as time goes by with each epoch, that number, that curation tax then goes down. There are two proposals out there in terms of how that curve would look like. Um, there's one with a straight line where it reduces, I think, by seven and a half percent with with every day until it hits that two and a half percent, and I think that is day seven. And at that point, it's just continuously two and a half percent. So what you would have to decide as a curator is, first of all, it's supposed to give you time to do your job, right? That that is one goal that um, we currently don't seem you know to be able to provide. Um, and then, you know, depending on how strong your confidence is, you know, in, in that subgraph, you can then decide at what point in time to, to move in, knowing that the earlier you move in, the higher, you know, the taxation will be. So you start to create a risk reward profile, so to say, based on the time that, that you join. Um, I, I find it um, certainly interesting. Um, provide feedback in the forum. There is going to be more discussions uh, that I know that Slim Chance is having uh, with in the curator community. Um, to me, this seems to be the most pressing, you know, issue right now, and this proposal seems to be the one that um, seems to address it in the best way possible. If there are other ideas out there, please come forward, share them with us in the forum, and if you like that idea or have other thoughts to that, please also provide feedback in the forum as well. There's one other uh, item on the list for GIP and, and, and governance that I've missed putting on here. Uh, Brandon just reminded me that is the arbitration charter. Do you wanna give us an update on that, Brandon? Yeah, this one will be quick. I just wanna make sure folks uh, were kept in the loop. So basically uh, there's two main pieces of engineering work that's kind of blocking fully adopting the arbitration charter and the API uh, and like the subgraph feature version in GIPs. One is, um, uh, actually tweaking the graph node to produce a valid POI in the case of a failed subgraph. Right now, it just returns null. And so this was a, a change to the arbitration charter that came out of discussions in the forums where, you know, basically the community reached a consensus that actually it did make sense for indexers to be able to receive rewards for failed subgraphs. Um, but right now, the graph node just isn't equipped to produce POIs for failed subgraphs. And so um, there's work that's ongoing right now to, to change that. And the other piece is feature detection. So we have a GIP that um, the arbitration charter depends on that outlines um, how to tell if a subgraph is supported in the protocol for indexing rewards, disputes, and other features. Um, but there's no way of actually detecting those features right now. And so the graph node team is working on um, feature detection for a number of different features that will impact um, support in the protocol. And I think you can also expect some of that feature detection to be incorporated into some of the ecosystem tooling like the Subgraph um, Studio and the Explorer where you would be able to, in the UI, see, you know, hey, this Subgraph uses uh, unsupported features that, you know, may make it ineligible for indexing rewards, which is something that, um, you know, an indexer would want to know up front. You know, that Subgraph Oracle that we mentioned earlier, another one of its jobs is to disable indexing rewards for Subgraphs that are ineligible for those rewards. And so as an indexer, before you do the work of, you know, spending you know, hours indexing something, that's that's helpful, helpful context to have. So both of that is um, are coming in the near term. And so I would say just stay tuned for that. And we should probably have more updates by the next core devs call. Very good. Thank you, Brandon. Okay, we're moving on to streaming fast. Alexandre is going to give us an update 
on where they're at with the integration and also talk about something that uh, is very interesting, which is called the fire hose. Alexandre, take it away. <laughs> very interesting. Okay, thank you to so Alex and the CTO at the Streaming Fast. Uh, and uh, happy to, to have recently joined this ecosystem to, uh, to bring our focus, let's say, of increasing indexing performance. That's for the short-term aspects. Uh, so maybe integration in progress, uh, we can say that we have uh, worked hard on bringing a few insights directly into the graph node recently. So we have a few PRs up and running there, um, upgrading libraries, some, some very low level work, actually some, you know, futures and, and uh, Tokyo library updates is, are there to enable the next stage of, you know, performance increases in the graph node. So we've been doing, been doing some work there and also at the same time integrating the fire hose as a source of data. Um, and maybe I could just swip swap to the fire hose quickly here. Um, so we've posted on the, the forum. If you go to the forum, you search Firehose. Um, I think it's just a sticky name, right? Uh, it's a sticky name. It's a, it's a pattern rather than a product because it's your product. It's our, it's our thing together. It's just we know what we talk about and we say that. But we posted like some of the rational, the ideas around. It's a little, you know, a different way to produce and consume blockchain data. And there's a, a, a few lists of, I think, fair points that have excited those who have read it. <laughs> so maybe I could just, you know, highlight a few of the things that make the fire hose so appealing because it, it's a way to, you know, handle high throughput chains by providing, uh, you know, uh, also uh, increases in linear indexing performance. And so maybe, I don't know if it's appropriate, the sort of people we have here to to get into some details. So the reasons for that, uh, you know, is as if we have files that are unpacked in some threads, the data is always ready to be processed and indexed in memory when it's when it arrives. So it's it's very fast. It's a fast way to push data down to the indexer instead of the indexer going to fetch for it. So um, and so it reduces the risk of non-deterministic output also because you get fed with data and the data itself is deterministic. There's much less network round trip when we'd use such an approach. And uh, yeah, it also is sort of the groundwork necessary for some of the more crazy things that are to come that are sort of short term, but uh, you know, a little bit midterm also is to bring all the parallelization. This thing was designed for massive parallelization. And if we can get that in, in some ways, then all of a sudden we can get to those 800 X performance. I was chatting yesterday with some indexers that are present here. Uh, just by the way, I, had, I didn't say that. It is my goal to chat and have a good conversation with all of the indexer community, right? We're working on performance. I want to understand your pain points. Yesterday I had a great conversation with some of you guys understanding some of the reasons why the speed is important, like it's very crucial for us to get to that. Um, an example I heard was that sushi swaps taking so much time that at some point it was risky to even try to index it because it couldn't fall in the 28 day window. So it changes dynamics there. Make, make, so by all means, if I'm all wrong on that, please correct me, come to me and, and uh, make sure we, uh, we, <laughs> We, we, we fit all these things together so we work in collaboration. But, uh, but I understood that yesterday. That's why I saw like having that being really fast is actually important, even in the short term. So that'll influence a little bit of our short term focus. Uh, but right, right. Uh, okay. I, I appreciate when interactions happen. So if you have any questions, <laughs> just drop them there. And then maybe I can just give a small idea of our short term focus here. So our, our short-term focus is going to be to bring as fast as possible, you know, performance improvements. And, and for that, we'll see that uh, we're gonna, so first of all, we're gonna be uh, open sourcing all that stack. Uh, some of them are not yet open. Uh, so I'm gonna, we're gonna sort of just make sure they're uh, um, easily uh, consumable. And I wanna work with some of the indexes so that you guys run fire hoses and you get an understanding of what what, what, what it is, right? What's the cost structure, which I had a nice chat about yesterday, which has advantage even in, ter even in terms of cost. So a quick, quick glimpse in there, like we had an example, I think the uh, uh, Kuhn, 
it was telling us that the BSC archive node was, was it close to 10 terabytes on the NVMe, like getting closer to the limits that he can have on the NVMe. And that the, the packed version of the data, which we use for indexing when we did the pancake swap thing is close to 1.2 terabytes. So much smaller, also much less cost because they're just on storage. And if you don't read those files, you can put on cold storage, on, on icy storage, on, on a low Kelvin storage. I don't know, something like that. With these cloud providers, they have wonky names, right? Um, so, um, so that we're, we're going to bring some of that to you as soon as possible. My goal is to get that feedback from you guys as soon as possible. So when you get to the fire hose, if you could try it, give us some feedback, see how it impacts so we can discuss together, like what's the true impact that's going to give and, and decide like what's the best way forward. So, and because I think the people thing is going to be the, the hardest, I want to make sure all the tech is pushed out and you guys can try it and we'll see what sticks, what doesn't stick, right? What people want and not want. And, um, Right, so the fastest path to speed up. So we've been discussing also with a few of you guys about you know the improvements that was uh, demonstrated with the pancake swap. So I want to put that out also, so you guys can try it, dabble with it, and see how we go forward with that. And that will also be you know the introduction of the the, the parallelization. So you guys can have I'll have that write up RFC style probably in the README, so you can understand what it means. What's the dynamics of parallelization of subgraphs and also a sample implementation that we can try today. And I know some of you guys, some, some came to us, like they want to try right now because they have an imminent problem. And so maybe we could, you know, do something about sushi swap because it's close to pancake swap. So I don't know if people are interested in helping out, trying that out. By all means, I'll be very interested to talk to you as we sort of integrate and get to learn all, like all of you guys. Does that make sense? Is that appropriate? as a first uh, core dev yeah. thing. Very appropriate, yes. Thank you, I appreciate your support there. Of course, and if there's anything uh, that we can help with just to, to connect with folks that you wanna get feedback on, reach out to me, I'm more than happy to facilitate that. Um, if we want to, you know, maybe schedule a workshop session you know, where you can have deeper discussions around that, you know, we've got different ways where we can get feedback. I, mean, I know you've got it in the forum uh, and, and sometimes uh, it doesn't catch everyone's attention. And if you like to get uh, a little bit more attention to that, just let me know. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you for that, Alex. And with that, we go to semi idiotic. I'm going to stop sharing because Sam is going to take over and walk us through uh, their piece and their own presentation they've got. Here we go. Automated right. pro-social negotiations. Take it away. Thanks, Oliver. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here today. Um, I'm Sam Green. I'm the CTO of Semiotic AI, and I'm joined by Matt Dybel, who is a research scientist at Semiotic. And today we're going to be talking about automated pro-social negotiations in the graph protocol. So first I will give an overview of reinforcement learning and the areas where we can apply it in the graph. And then I'll hand it over to Matt, who will talk about research related to providing robust pro-social behavior to RL agents. Okay, so reinforcement learning is a branch of artificial intelligence, and it is focused on making automated decisions in uncertain environments. And the graph has many opportunities where we can apply RL to. For example, we can build tools for indexers to automatically select prices, which lead to the best long-term profitable outcome for the indexers. We can also build tools uh, RL agent based tools for indexers to automatically optimize their infra infrastructure, again, leading to long term profits. And we can build tools for consumers to find high quality indexers and pick query prices that will uh, lead to their lowest costs. So why, why this care for pro social behavior for our RL agents? Well, we certainly don't want to be deploying agents that are maximally extractive at the expense of the health of the protocol. And on the other hand, we need robust behavior to uh, give our agents the ability to basically defend against adversaries that may exist inside the protocol. 
All right. So as a part of this reinforcement learning effort, uh, we wanted to do a deeper investigation into how we can actually get uh, the behaviors we want in the agents that we train. So to do that, we took a look at uh, this paper, Pro-Social or Selfish, which uh, explored a uh, sort of generalized negotiation format where two deep neural network agents uh, negotiate over the inclusion or exclusion of six different clauses. So at the beginning of one of these negotiations, each agent will be uh, given a randomly generated utility vector. So this utility vector will have six numbers. Some of them will be negative, denoting that the agent uh, would actually get punished if that uh, um, clause was included in the final deal. And some of them are positive, meaning the agent would benefit from that clause being included in the final deal. Now it's important to note that both of these are randomly generated every single negotiation. So sometimes these utility vectors will be very similar and there will be a lot of common ground between the agents and uh, thus it'll be a lot easier for them to um, come to a, a good agreement. Uh, and sometimes they'll be very different in which case it will be very hard for them to come to an agreement that works for both of them. So to actually facilitate this negotiation, uh, agent A will begin by sending an offer vector to agent B. This offer vector will contain uh, six bits with a zero, meaning that agent A wants to exclude that clause from their deal, and a one, meaning that that agent wants to include that clause in their deal. So in this case, agent A sent over uh, offer sub zero and uh, in this case, he wants to include uh, clause four and clause six. Agent B can then look at that offer and he can pr propose a counter offer. So in this case, agent B proposed that clause two and clause four be included in the final deal. Uh, once again, agent A can look at that and propose a counter offer. Uh, if at any point, uh, agent A or agent B proposes the same offer that they were just given, then that is an agreement and the negotiation ends and uh, the final contract is the offer that they agreed on. If, however, they continue going back and forth and don't reach an agreement, eventually they hit a deadline that we imposed, which in this case is when they have each offered 15 uh, different offers. So now for the uh, exciting part, the reward functions. This is uh, actually the only thing we need to uh, shape these agents and get very different behaviors. So the paper set out two different uh, reward functions that uh, are, are fairly similar, but they get very different behaviors. Uh, the first one is a selfish reward function. This one is simply the uh, utility that an agent is getting out of the deal. So if a deal is made, uh, this is shorthand for the total utility that an agent is getting out of the deal. And if no deal is made, then a small punishment is given to disincentivize stalemates. Uh, the pro-social reward function on the right here is uh, very similar, uh, with the only change being that a pro-social agent only gets rewarded for the utility it's getting out of the deal if the deal is optimal. So a pro-social agent still wants to maximize its own benefit, but it will not do so at the cost of the other participants in the environment, which as you can imagine is, is very desirable in uh, a network that we want to maximize the overall health of. So these two uh, create some very interesting behaviors, but we also wanted to explore some other uh, behaviors. So we actually proposed some additional reward functions uh, the first one we proposed is the uh, total reward function, and this one will be the uh, uh, total reward of all participants of the network. So in this bilateral negotiation case, uh, the total reward for an agent will be the selfish reward of one agent plus the selfish reward of its opponent. So this agent is actually completely selfless in that it only cares about the utility that everyone is getting and does not care how much it actually gets for itself. So this is extremely helpful for uh, maximizing the total utility, but it is very uh, vulnerable to um, malicious attacks, which you will see on the coming slides. We also explored an adversarial reward function over here, 
which you can see is uh, the selfish reward for uh, an agent minus the selfish reward for all other agents. So this agent is trying to maximize its own gain while actively trying to minimize all other agents gain. So as you can imagine, if this adversarial agent is successful in uh, maximizing this reward function, it means that it is extracting maximal value from the uh, protocol while uh, leaving others with nothing or even worse off than they started, which is obviously not what we want at all. So we would never deploy an agent trained with this reward function, but it is incredibly useful to use within simulation to poke at the other agents that we have, as well as poke at the protocol itself so that we can find vulnerabilities in both of those things and fix them in simulation before they are found in the real world and exploited there. So now we want to show some results. So uh, we can see lots of different behaviors by matching up these different reward functions. So I'm gonna go through a few examples of those. And for each one, I'm gonna show two things. Uh, number one is going to be some test statistics that were collected over 10,000 trials. Those will include average scores for the pro-social and selfish agent. Uh, in this case, you can see that the selfish agent uh, outscored the pro-social agent by a significant bit, which makes sense because uh, the selfish only cares about himself. So he's able to take advantage of the pro-social. I will also show the optimality percentage. So the percent of deals that are optimal, uh, the agreement percentage, which is the percent of uh, of deals that actually end in an agreement and don't end with no deal being made, as well as the average dialogue length, which can be interpreted as sort of how agreeable they are, how long they take to come to a deal. So on the right, I actually have a visualization of this negotiation. So this will graph the uh, total utility that each agent is getting in the neg negotiation over time. At the top, you will see the current offer highlighted in the color of the agent that is proposing it. And on the left and right, you will see the utility vectors that have been assigned to each agent, as well as the uh, current uh, proportion of the maximum utility they can get uh, that they are getting out of the current offer. So now if I play this video, you can see this back, of fo back and forth as uh, each agent takes turn uh, um, proposing offers to each other. In all of these visualizations, you will see a very uh, jagged uh, result because uh, the agents are pro taking turns proposing offers that are better for themselves. One important thing to note here is that the selfish agent is reaching much higher peaks all along here because uh, it only cares about itself. It's trying to offer rewards that will maximize its own gain while the pro-social agent is offering uh, agents uh, offers that are not perhaps the best for themselves, but actually reach an optimal deal for both of them. And you can see in this particular case, uh, on time step 20, it did actually end in a deal, which was quite good for both of them, but slightly better for the selfish, which is indicative of how uh, these will usually turn out. So next we can look at, next we can look at uh, selfish versus selfish. Uh, this one is uh, very interesting. You can see in this animation, there uh, is a lot less agreeable. They're actually, for most of the beginning, they are just uh, going back and forth, proposing the same set of offers to each other. Um, it's not until the very end, when there is about to be a deadline, that they actually start trying to work with each other. And eventually on the last time step, they do come up with a deal uh, that they can make. Now, these statistics here are uh, somewhat interesting. Uh, you may expect that two selfish agents would not be able to agree much, but actually when they are trained against each other, they learn that if they don't compromise, they're not gonna get their selfish reward because no agreement will be made. So actually when you train these two selfish agents against each other, they do learn to compromise a bit. And as a result, you actually have a pretty decent optimality rate and agreement rate. So we can also look at pro-social agents versus pro-social agents. Um, this one is, as you might expect, uh, very nice. Uh, the optimality rate and agreement rate are extremely high and the average dialogue length is 
uh, extremely low, which shows that these agents have a common objective and are able to work together quickly to achieve it. So if you watch this uh, sample negotiation here, uh, this one is actually one of the longer ones. Usually they end after only a few time steps because these two agents are able to very quickly come to an agreement on what they want. And you can see in this case that they did come to a good agreement for both of them as they're both getting positive utility. Now we can actually do even better by matching up two total agents. So as we said before, these agents are completely selfless and just want to maximize the total benefit of everyone within the network. And as a result, when you match two of these up, you get a uh, pretty much 100% agreement rate. They always come to a deal. Uh, and you also get the highest optimality rate that we've seen. Uh, and correspondingly, you can see the highest combined average score as well, and the shortest average dialogue length, which shows that they're even more agreeable than the two prosocial agents. So if we play one of these sample negotiations, uh, it's very quick. Uh, you can see, uh, interestingly, that it ended with total one getting no utility out of the deal, but he doesn't care because the other agent got a ton of utility out of the deal. So he's still very happy because overall the network really benefited from this negotiation. So the picture is a little less rosy when we uh, compare this total agent against an adversarial agent. So if you look at the statistics here, uh, it's pretty terrible. The total agent is only getting on average 0 0.02 while the adversarial is getting 0.88. So the total agent is absolutely just getting completely taken advantage of by this adversarial agent. And if we actually look at the negotiation, it's quite interesting because these agents seem to be so disagreeable on their negotiations that they just stalemate for most of the negotiation. Uh, it's not until the very end when there's a deadline that they actually try to find some common ground. And in this case, you can see that the adversarial gets a huge utility and the total got a tiny utility. So once again, illustrating that uh, the total agent can really get taken advantage of by this adversarial agent. So lastly, I wanna look at uh, a pro-social agent versus an adversarial agent. So as I've highlighted before, the pro-social agent uh, is trying to be pro-social, but it's not selfless. It does care about maximizing its own uh, utility as well as the overall health of the network. And as such, you can see in these statistics, uh, the pro-social is still losing out overall, but it's, it's much less, uh, less extreme than the total agent versus the adversarial agent. And you can also see when we play this negotiation, there's a similar sort of stalemate, but they start trying to negotiate with each other much quicker. Uh, and in this case, they're actually able to reach an agreement where both benefit, actually both benefit quite a bit. Um, which is a, a good illustration of some of the, the strengths and weaknesses of these pro-social and total reward functions. So that was sort of an overview of how these uh, different reward functions can create behaviors in this abstract negotiation setup. Uh, moving back to applications within the graph protocol, uh, we can imagine a few different uh, applications of these reward functions. Um, as you all probably know right now, the gateway acts as an interface between consumers and indexers. And we can imagine a world in which we uh, train that gateway via the total reward function to maximize the total utility received by all consumers and indexers. We can also uh, look forward to the future when consumers and indexers negotiate directly with each other and in that scenario, we can train agents for a consumer and indexer to uh, negotiate directly with, to each other uh, on the price of a query or even on a long-term service level agreement for uh, a long-term relationship for serving a type of query. Uh, those are just a few examples. Overall, we see a ton of applications of uh, reinforcement learning and more specifically these uh, uh, goal-driven reward functions. Uh, at the end of the day, we think a lot of these tools will have a very large impact on the overall health and profitability for everyone um, of the graph protocol. So 
Uh, I think we have a little bit of time for questions now. Um, if we don't get to anything or there's a more in-depth question, you can feel free to reach out to me or Sam uh, at our emails, which are listed at the bottom there. Thank you. We do have a couple of questions. So that was uh, you know, a great presentation. Thank you for that, Matt and, and yep. Sam. Um, now the question went away. There we go. <laughs> I have to pull up the chat. Okay, the first question is, is the average length of the dialogue captured in the utility vectors used by each agent? No, so the, uh, the utility vectors just define how each agent will value each clause if it is included in the final deal. If uh, the deadline is reached with no deal, then each agent just gets a flat, small punishment to uh, sort of uh, disincentivize that wasting of negotiation resources. Where, where do you see this going as as next step? What would you like you know to do you know and maybe share with the community what what you plan on doing next? Sure. So we've already done a little bit of work. Uh, with the uh, ISA formulating it as an RL environment or an RL agent. Uh, so moving forward with that would be quite interesting. I do think there's a lot of potential in uh, training that with this sort of total good of the environment because the gateway should be impartial. So uh, maximizing the total good of the environment is a little less hard to uh, take advantage of in that scenario. Um, and also the sort of uh, direct uh, negotiations are quite interesting because that moves further towards decentralization. So uh, if we can facilitate that with the same framework, that would also be awesome in the future. Very good. I think to, to Yonan's point, one uh, utility function that we've discussed that I think came up in the office hours last week was, uh, you know, basically valuing the decentralization of the network, right? So that could be an example of a pro-social utility function that one of these agents is trained on. Um, and specific, more specific to Yannan's point, uh, one of the selection criteria that had been considered for the ISA uh, was what we were calling negotiation efficiency. So that could also be, you know, actually what Yannan described, that could be a utility function in one of these agents in the future where both, you know, agents on one side value shorter negotiation rounds um, and, you know, the indexers correspondingly uh, try to optimize to keep negotiation rounds short. Any other questions anyone has, please post them in the chat. Anyone who's uh, here on the panel, feel free to ask any other questions you might have. Yeah, so in, uh, in practice, we may want to, instead of just making this uh, sort of a hard cutoff either or, uh, we may want to make it a more continuous incentivization for shorter dialogue lengths. Um, I definitely see that as a, as a valuable thing that we can include in future, future experiments. Very good. Thank you again, Matt and Sam. So don't see any, any more questions at this point. And also no other questions for the call itself outside of semiotic. So we can actually leave a little early today. Nine minutes left. Give you back the time. Thank you everyone for joining. You are going to see the notes posted here in the next uh, couple of days. And we try to be as fast as we can with posting uh, the video also on YouTube. Thank you all for joining. Thanks, Oliver. Thanks, everyone.